These are the most publicised policemen in Britain. They're the task force of the West Yorkshire Police in Leeds, who've been given the grim job of investigating the so-called Ripper murders. Five new men were drafted in to lead Britain's biggest ever manhunt, following the frenzy of publicity after the Ripper's 13th killing. As the hunt took a new turn, World in Action arranged to film the police operation as it really is. We wanted to show the hard slog and unglamorous routine, which is the real story behind the hunt for the Ripper. Most of the senior men on the Ripper inquiry are from outside Yorkshire, but they're led by Assistant Chief Constable Jim Hobson, a Leeds detective who has worked on three Ripper murders. People working on the ground will get confidence from the fact that senior officers are being called in from other police forces, people that have dealt with many, many murders. And what we're hoping to do on the inquiry by bringing these experts in to advise me uh, is to simply put a change of emphasis on the inquiries we're doing. That change of emphasis is felt here at the nerve center of the operation, the incident room at Leeds. Three weeks after the latest murder, tip-offs and hunches pour in at the rate of 2,000 telephone calls a day. Hello, Colin, the one we spoke about earlier. Uh, I'm having trouble finding the previous, but I've spoken to the boss. World in Action agreed not to transmit any conversation that might compromise lines of inquiry, many of which have opened up since the last murder. Could you possibly find from your friend the name of this gentleman? Well, no, but perhaps with yours being fairly fresh, he might be able to provide an alibi for the 17th that would put him out. I mean, putting him out for the others now would be The new leads will be investigated by the man in charge of the incident room, Inspector Bob Browell. Well, what happens when a suspicious vehicle is reported by a member of the public or the police to you? Well, first of all, we would check with the computer to see if we could establish the owner of the vehicle. That's assuming we had a full registered number. If we had a partial number, we would come to this vehicle index that you see here. And this index is cross-referenced so that we can trace a vehicle through make, colour and or a partial registration. If, for instance, we were told that the car was a white Volvo and we had no registered number, then we could check in the index and look under white Volvos. Could we just have a look at Yes. All these cards in this system now relate to Volvos. And it would be a matter of looking through to see if we could find one of the relevant colour to start with. Having found the colour, we can establish the registered number from this card. We'll go to the relevant box. And then we find the corresponding card, which includes not only the vehicle number, make and colour, but the details of the owner by his name and address. So you have the vehicle, and now you have the owner. That's right. Now, if, is there any way that you can find out anything about the owner? By going to the master index at the other side of the room, yes. uh, the owner there should have another card on which we will have his personal particulars, so far as this inquiry is concerned, i.e. whether he's being seen or not, and if so, why, whether he was a witness, uh, a suggestion, and whether he has, in fact, been interviewed or not. We have in the system at the moment somewhere in the region of 160,000 vehicles. The names in the main index is in excess of a quarter of a million people. It is not uncommon for one person to be nominated by several others. And to avoid duplication, we keep the index as up-to-date as we can, because nothing can be more upsetting than to be visited by detectives week after week after week, purely because you happen to uh, be a jury or have a wayside accent. There's no doubt a lot of us... Uh, I'm worried about him. Is there, any other, is there any other way we can trace him? We certainly get information from the public, which we know from the outset is not likely to produce results. But nevertheless, we have to follow it up. At the moment, the people in this room are working a minimum 12-hour day, six days a week. 
it is also a little bit strenuous. For all we are office bound, we're constantly answering telephones, we're constantly writing, reading. And by the end right, of then. the 12 hours, you know that you've had a hard day. From time to time, into this room must come the most recent leads. Uh, is there a feeling of hope at the moment? Oh, yes, hopes are high, because with this last murder, the public response has been tremendous. And you have some leads that are promising that have come into this room recently? Yes, we have some promising leads, uh, and hopefully one of these will lead us to the man that we want. Yes, Hello. Certainly, uh, I think in the, in the uh, early stages, uh, he was after prostitutes. I think there must be something in his background. They were easier to get. Yeah, they just yeah, that's it. Because they get into cars. Just. Uh, They're waiting for a bloke to come up. That's right. Yeah. He just goes, goes up to a prostitute, calls her over to the car, they agree a price, gets in the car. They don't have to know the area because they know him very well. They know where they take the client. So, so. Um, it's a question of, uh, well, of just driving where she wants to go. Yeah, I would have thought not known any someone particular woman has obviously upset him or a group oh, of women yeah. at one time, which has brought him on to say, you know, to start and all this off. Um, yeah, but I think personally. Types of character, surely, oh yeah, be more like a Jekyll no, and Hyde yeah. character. No, no, he's got some split personality. Yeah. Um, I think it is. Um, there's a possibility he has been. Uh, spoken to during this inquiry, but so. uh, I, w I would say so personally. He's so clever, he's not we an haven't imbecile done anything. Anything. We haven't sort of sat back and spent all that money and done nothing. Yeah. We've spent that money trying to trace a man that's committing all these murders. We don't like sitting around or pay to be sitting around doing nothing yeah. because we are, whether he's committing a man, it's all in the news and everything. We're still carrying on inquiries, going through, you know, lines of inquiries that could help catch him. There's nobody come forward and said that guy was obviously the ripper. No. He's, 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 he's able to slip in and out of an area. Yeah. A lot of people are giving us information that they want to remain anonymous because people they are suggesting suggesting are normal people, normal family men who are friends of the family sort of thing, you know, or the local doctors, something like that, you know. They're suggesting normal people now, we're not just getting weirdos. It was something yeah. daft. Uh, we just had no look at all. It's probably, as you say, a parking ticket which maybe he doesn't pay, he's got to go yeah. to court, he yeah. doesn't attend court. A warranty shield, something like that. And when it's picked up, it starts to, it starts to panic. Shouldn't have been There are 5,000 police officers in this force, not a small force by any means. Each one of those, as they go out on their patrols today, will be thinking and looking and wanting to do something about this murder. I've often wondered this, how many times I've actually walked past him in the street, unknowingly. Um, this is the sort of thing you, you begin to think, you know, have I, do I know him? Do I, does he live in the area that I work? This is the, the nurse's home. Uh, I was telling you about, again, it's sort of reasonably well, this area. Nonetheless, um, it isn't all that good. This is one of the places where I'd want to be uh, keeping a regular eye on. Just to make sure that there wasn't anybody hanging about, just seeing what was going on. Unlike the majority of murders, where you've got a readily identifiable suspect, whether it be a boyfriend or a husband or somebody who has got some motive for doing the killing, this guy's can strike anywhere. It's so easy. You can conceive yourself in a doorway. Um, there's no particular reason why he chooses any any victim. I can understand the difficulty, and but it's difficult to get this understanding over to the public. How do you, how do you start looking for this fella? Anybody? Anybody you see walking down the street? My beat, fortunately or unfortunately, as a policeman, it covers scenes of three Ripper murders. There's a Jenny MacDonald right in the middle of my beat. The first one, Wilma McCann, is just alongside my beat area and one of the victims, Jackson, lived on the border of my beat. So 
really, as a community beat man, the Ripper is very much involved on my area and uh, must have knocked around it quite a lot. Alan Mawson's beat is Chapel Town in the heart of Leeds. He was on the task force for four of the Ripper murders. We do a fingertip search and you get down on your hands and knees, shoulder to shoulder, and you don't miss a blade of grass. And the idea is that you can pick a pin up or a, a drawing pin, something as small as that, and you don't miss it. And then a sort of a broader search further out, the drains are checked, the dustbins, back gardens. The dustbins is our job. We usually have plastic bags and plenty of protective gear on and um, it's not very nice turning a dustbin out. It's full of curry and nappies and all the scrapings off the dinner plates and stuff, but you've got to go through it and see if what we're looking for is there. Probably that the public don't appreciate as regards murder inquiries, the house to house situation is all right, we interview a lot of innocent people, but we have to alibi those people. If we're asking for people's movements between six and nine PM at night time, or even all night, if they say they've been out we know we've got a little bit more work to do because we've got to follow up who they've been to visit and verify, or if they've been to a pub or a club or anything, we've got to go visit that place and say, did so-and-so in fact come that night? An alibi the statement. And I wish, I suppose, for inquiries that when we go to the house and they say, what did you do between these two intervals? And they say, I never went out, we stayed in, with my wife, we watched television and then went to bed. And that is nice, you know, because we've got one house completed and uh, there's been no moments. But that's a selfish way because you've got a form finished and that house has been dealt with. What we're really after is someone actually walking down the street where the murder happened and they've seen something happen. If there's a, a murder inquiry like the Ripper that goes on and on where we're getting nothing, we have to keep doing it until the job's been completed and sometimes you can't see the end in sight at all. I'd guess at thousands, it feels like thousands anyway. Um, you just, you're nearly brainwashed doing it. It can really get you down, but you've got to do it. How many hours a day do you work immediately after a murder? We start off normally on uh, 12 hours and uh, sometimes even more than that. And how many, how many days a week for...? Well, we work six days a week and we have four days, over t uh, four days off a month. So you're doing a six-day week, 12-hour days minimum? That's to start with, yeah. Do you find it boring, I mean, asking the same questions at house after house? Not at all. Morale's high and we're, we're hoping that the next person we speak to will have a clue which may lead us to find this man. Police have visited 1,100 houses since Jacqueline Hill's murder. So far, 3,000 people have been interviewed, 700 statements have been taken down, and 500 cars and vehicles have been checked out. But it will be weeks before alibis are thoroughly investigated. The hunt for the Ripper preoccupies every police station in Leeds. But the everyday emergencies of a big city still have to be dealt with. He's rung her tonight to say that he's end of this tether and threatening suicide. She's tried ringing his telephone number, but he's taking the phone off the hook. I'll give you more details when I get back. I think what does really make, make us angry more than anything is, is when you say stop a motorist for a man in traffic defense, and he comes out with the old saying, um, it's a pity you can't catch the ripper rather than stop me and report me for this, that, and It's a pity you've nothing better to do. This is the thing that really niggles. How do you um, respond to that? I mean, well, the response is that, OK, we're looking for the ripper, but we still have our ordinary, everyday duties to perform as possible. We can't ignore minor traffic offences. 
We can't take. We can't ignore missing children. We can't ignore stray dogs. We can't ignore thefts, burglaries, and anything else. We've got to concentrate on, on other aspects of police work as well. But the Ripper's always there, of course. Whiskey Mike, do you want to come? Oh, yes, it's Oscar Whiskey Yankee 576 Mike. Whiskey Mike, do you want to come? Shall we pull it? Yeah. Pull in, please. Good morning, sir. It's just a check. Is this your vehicle, please? Yeah. Can you tell me the registered number of it, please? Uh, all the way. Uh-huh. And it's your vehicle, you say? Yeah. Have you got your driving license, have you? Are you still living at this address at uh, Hill Terrace? What address have you moved to, Mr. Doty? Hmm? What address have you moved to from here, Hill? Twenty-one. Could you tell me where you would be a fortnight last two, uh, Monday night, sir? No. Uh-huh. In the evening, sir. Okay, nice. You'd be in the house. Are you married, sir? Yeah. Uh-huh. Family? As I see it, though, I think he must uh, travel around in a vehicle to uh, look at these spots, to commit the uh, murders. Um, I don't think it's on the spec of the moment. I think he plans these uh, areas where he's going to uh, strike next. So any vehicle that, that's acting suspiciously travelling slowly at the curb, uh, any areas where there's um, heavily populated with women, uh, any vehicles in the area, there's no harm in stopping them and checking them. Uh, we've got the power to do it, so we might as well stop them. Woo! Oh, uh, you want to check in, Ben? Good morning, it's just a check. This is your vehicle, please. Yes, it does. Have you any driving documents on it? No. Is there anything at all to prove your identification? No. What do you do for a living, uh, Mr. Barrett? Engineer. Engineer? Just working now. Victor Yankee Yankee, 293 Golf. Where would you be about a fortnight ago? Monday night. Oh, I'm not Jack Murray. Uh, I'm not. Underworld tip-offs also have a part to play in the hunt for the Ripper. Criminal Intelligence Sergeant Greg Beaumont. We might get, for instance, an anonymous telephone call um, from somebody suggesting the voice on the Ripper tape recording uh, is of a man who, say, was in Durham prison in 1968. The, the caller perhaps doesn't know um, his second name, perhaps only knows him as Ken. Uh, and so he refers to him as Geordie Ken. He might remember that uh, whilst he was inside, he, he hated women and said he was going to get his own back on a woman uh, when he was uh, released. And so all we've got is the fact that he's a Geordie and uh, his name is Ken. And the very good contacts we've got within the prison service and various other establishments um, will inevitably help us to uh, put an identity to, to the name and hopefully um, trace a, an up-to-date address. Following the Jacqueline Hill murder, calls from the public have kept the Ripper incident room constantly active. There was no arrangement made to meet this man at all. We know where we are, don't we? One at all is that? Yeah, I'll check the index there. We just don't have the manpower to do it. What a British national is involved in it. Yeah. Why do you want to know, sir? 
Peter. Yes. But officers acknowledge that before the latest tragedy, which came 442 days after his previous murder, there were times when they thought the Ripper wouldn't strike again. I think everybody was hoping that the, the one in September last year was the last, and that although we were sort of obviously carrying out the inquiries and we were doing what we could do patrolling around, I think we were sort of secretly optimistic that it wouldn't happen again. The fact that it has happened again within the last couple of weeks, it brings it all back to you. And the fact that it's in Leeds again, you're always aware that it could happen in your own area again. Are they all looking for the Ripper every day? Well, obviously, that's something that we've got to get over to them. It's a, a problem sustaining the efforts of these men. They're working long hours, uh, but it's something we can do. He's all clapped out after talking all day and that, uh, and probably your wife thinks you're a bit unsociable and miserable outside, but it's just how you feel physically drained, mm. or mentally drained, anyway. I found after so long, um, perhaps two weeks when he'd worked a long time and only had one day off, this sounds awful, but it's true, that when he did have a day off and he came back for a whole day, he was invading my privacy then. <laughs> he was. He was no longer yeah. part of that. After two weeks where you've had to do everything in the house by yourself or with a baby, when he comes back, he's not part of it straight away. He's a stranger. He's a stranger, yes, and yeah. he was invading my privacy. It used to take me a few days yeah. to get back. We're constantly looking for signs of strain, and that's a very big part of this inquiry. By signs of strain, you mean mistakes? Well, not mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I've made mistakes in the past, and anybody that says he hasn't is not telling the truth. The human errors will always occur, won't they? Some feminist groups have claimed that lack of concern among a police force dominated by men is one reason for the failure to catch the Ripper. I suppose as fellas we don't realise just what it's like to be a frightened woman. How would we feel like if there were a, a rampant woman knocking about, knocking off men? <laughs> Great. How would we feel? I mean, we, we don't know what being frightened is, do we? We just accept it that the woman is frightened of a man. But um, it would be a different story if the man was frightened of a woman. <laughs> Uh, for those who, the operational commander tonight, is Superintendent McQuaid on my left. We're splitting up into uh, two units. One unit will be the uh, escort squad under Inspector. A Graham. series of protest marches by women's groups in Leeds has meant an extra drain on the resources of the West Yorkshire Police, a fact that concerns Assistant Chief Constable Stanley Boothroyd. They're not on the, in my opinion, what they would primarily have been on. Had we not been in this situation? What would they have been doing if well, they were Well, they would have up? been, which they will be doing later and they will be doing now, they would have been increasing the number of foot patrols in the vulnerable areas of the city. 150 police were mobilised around Leeds city centre for a demonstration that never took place. Later that night, snow drove most people off the streets, but for many Leeds policemen, it was back to the beat. The public want him behind bars, certainly. They want this beasts away from their environment. They don't want to be having to think about how to get from one place to another without escort, taxi, or being run about. They just want the normal freedom without being frightened. Why doesn't Daddy catch the Ripper? Yeah. Um, he often asks that. Why doesn't Daddy catch the Ripper? So I say, well, we don't know what he looks like, but does he know where he lives? And I have to explain that if we knew where he lived, we could go knock on his door, or a policeman could, and bring him home. And he doesn't understand why it's not so simple to just go and catch him. He's seen too many movies on the police work, really, that it's all done in half an hour. Yeah. That's five-year-old, though, isn't it? Mm, that's innocent. They're there's, complacent. There's people a lot older than that who think that we've only got to lift the phone up and ring Scotland Yard, and they'll come bombing up the M1 with a magnifying glass and it'll all be done in a couple of days. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are people who generally believe that. They don't realise that we have some of the best fellows on the job. All the forensic and everything is available to us that, that we could ever wish for. Uh, all we just want is a bit of luck and 
one day we will catch him. I'm convinced we'll catch him. But when? That's the problem. Mm -hmm.